Welcome. Today's session is this one, facilitating soft skill excellence in STEM subjects and getting it to lead to outstanding achievement. And it's something I've been doing for about three years, four years now, uh, since we went to 20 credit modules and revalidated everything in sight. And uh, my boss kind of introduced me to a rather different way of working. And I'll summarize a few critical ideas, some of the things that I think are critical in sort of reflecting back on what I've done that's led to the sort of levels of achievement uh, from my students, which is kind of interesting. And what we have, and this is particularly in the field of, sort of data science, analytics, computing, um, but also I think in many, many other subject areas because we are continually um, browbeaten by the employers to whom our graduates go out to that we do not deliver employable students. They have no soft skills, they've got no ability to operate within an office. Yeah, they've got these technical skills to some degree, you know, the subject content, we've drummed the content into them. But we haven't done anything on that side. Here, we can actually tinge it to any subject area with a particular technical skills, you might say, whether it's um, architecture or engineering, could even be languages to some extent, literature, sports science, etc. etc. But what's on this side in the so-called right brain bit? Are they they've used this to show the soft skills. Skills such as curiosity. And one of the problems with our education system in this country is we take intensely curious little creatures of age two who keep asking why, 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 and so on. And by the time they're 17 or 18, They've learned not to be curious by and large. They don't want to go and find out things unless you encourage them dramatically. So we've got curiosity, we've got things like problem solving, but also problem identification. Why do they expect to have the problem given to them all the time? They should be looking for problems. They should be creative. Yeah, they should collaborate a bit. And we've had a discussion in the previous session around the corner. Um, about group work versus group assessment versus individual assessment of group work and so on. Um, communication and a phrase that I've seen coming out in business conferences in the last year, the phrase storytelling. That phrase has become more and more pervasive. Tell the story. And these are the sort of skills that businesses are really, really asking for. I went I had a colleague, Mosin Ferry, who went down to London uh, in January to run a workshop at a uh, retail organisations uh, conference on the data, uh, data analysis skills scan. And they were saying these are problems even within their own existing um, employee structure, let alone the problems they have with uh, our graduates. So we have a big problem, yes we seem as an AG to be able to deliver the technical skills relating to our subject area, but generally we are not terribly good at the soft skill side. In my field, yeah, we're handling things like IBM uh, Bluenix, IBM Watson Analytics, which you can see being demonstrated downstairs, uh, SAS, are various analytics statistics, these are technical side, not, that, not difficult. What we were using in some of the models I've been running and helped uh, other colleagues to build over the last year are to do those sort of things. Great, giving students huge autonomy in terms of here's a big challenge, you're going to learn by research, part of the learning by doing sort of approach. They have to go and have decided which bit of the big challenge they're going to uh, address. They then have to go and find data and then they have to find out how to do. Now, I'll cover a few of the reasons why that's so critically important. No, no. Just to be a little bit provocative, one of the annual um, bugbears we have here is the attendance monitoring. <coughs> Two final year modules I've put together, final semester, 
second it's levels from 0, 20, 30, 40, and so on, up to 100%, well, 90%. And the mark. Each of these points is a student with their attendance. So it's attendance and mark. And the fun bit, this formula is a correlation of that dotted line and the R squared factor of 0 0.03. There is no correlation whatsoever. It is in, totally irrelevant. The only thing that's relevant is did they attend the final formative, um, final draft formative review? Because they're researching all the time. This is a two part um, assessment. This is the articles for 70%, and the other bit was a the total which adds in a 30% worth of infographic poster. That's the sort of great profiles we're typically getting in this, with this approach to teaching. I can't remember what the average, I think the average is about 74%. And I think these were retakes or disengaged students from previous years. And this year. So what's back behind all of this? Go back two and a half thousand odd years to Plutarch. Education is not filling leaky buckets, but lighting fires in enthusiasm. And what that leads to is guided learning. I do not treat myself as an academic, as domain expert. Because if I do that, I have to spend all my contact time with them stuffing facts and figures and knowledge into their heads. And as we know, that doesn't stick. If you give them guided learning by becoming the academic as learning to learn expert, you're guiding and mentoring them all the way through. You're not teaching any facts, you're not giving any answers, you're purely teaching questions. And in our field of computing, there are too many languages. The product set that Watson Analytics comes from, there are 100 products within the IBM Bluemix field. Now, there's no way that I can know everything about all of those. But the students may want to choose any one or two or three of those. So I cannot learn everything about them to be ahead of the students. I need to encourage them to go find the right package for themselves. I know what they roughly do. So I can give that guidance, but then they have to go find out how to do it. And this is actually very, very much relates to how they will be working. And in fact, our second, third year students on placement do this. They don't get training because <coughs> the SMEs that they go to cannot afford the £3,000 or £2,000 form of training. Their colleagues there may have a little bit of time to tell them a little bit, and then it's go find the YouTubes. Go find the professional websites where you can find the blogs or whatever that answer your question. So they're truly learning to learn for lifelong learning. And interestingly, when they start doing this guided learning, those leaky buckets suddenly magically heal themselves. It's quite extraordinary. If they know they need to learn it, they will remember it and they will do things with it. And they will also know another important point, which is that the answer for today, in today's context, in this company, will change next week or in another company next year. <coughs> so you teach them only the questions. So we provide them with very big challenges that they have to narrow down. And this then ends up with some really interesting students as co-producers. Most of the assessments are either going to be articles, which then can be published over a particular boundary, or, and I'll show you with this one, the two I'm talking about today, very briefly, as examples, is they have to produce a video in the first semester, second, end of the second semester, first year, the students will produce a four minute video which can't work, um, is worth something in the order of 40% of their total grade. We give them tight criteria what they've got to put into that and you can see those uh, if you want to see them. Um, in a final year module, 
they have to do a 15 minute presentation PowerPoint and then they have to do a voiceover, which we then turn into videos. So we're using almost all the way through a lot of soft skill mechanisms for assessing their technical skills by using kind of reflective assessment uh, or reflective writing, reflective analysis, uh, simulating what they're going to be doing out there in business so they're getting a lot of employability uh, emphasis all the way through. And so now, these are sort of things that actually drive much of what we've been doing. It also leads to these sort of ideas. My contact time with them is far too valuable to teach them how to do a language, computing language. It's there to mentor them, to guide them, to challenge them on a one-to-one -one basis. And you can do that, and I've done it with groups of up to 40, 50, 60. Because I have a big seminar, and then we have the usual work group, workshop groups of 20s. And given the sort of students' propensities, to be not entirely regular attendees, that means a 20 becomes about a 15 or 8 or 16 group, and so you get more individual time with each student in a particular week. You're developing their skills of problem identification, problem solving, critical thinking, researching, uh, writing skills, so I can watch their assignment building week by week from week two or three. A critical thing coming out of some of the interesting theories about learning, we're giving them autonomy, we're giving them motivation, we're giving them content, confidence. The motivation comes very much <coughs> because you're saying, go find something within the big challenge that's interesting to you. So go find some data, I don't mind what it is. It could be this big, but if it's that big, then as long as it's something really interesting to you, that's going to be fun for you to do. And they work much harder if it's their own. And because of the work we do in terms of mentoring, their own self-confidence also appears uh, to grow dramatically. They learn to negotiate the topics. They're all done by research. Critically important, if you're going to end up with high achievement levels, you've got to make sure that you've got very robust rubrics. And the standard across most of the, uh, uh, the country are yeah, satisfactory, good, very good, exceptional. And that predicated on a standard, uh, sort of norm uh, median of around about 65%. So if you end up with a whole lot much higher than that, you're really going to have to normalize them back to about 65. So if you're ending up with a regular 75 median like I do, you've got to have something that holds it there and it cannot be scaled back. So you've got to have some interesting rubrics that are resistant to scaling, which means they have to relate to something outside, some external factors. We'll show, I'll look at those in a bit. But also, the rubrics must guide the students in how to achieve excellence and how to do the job. I mean, I've got one module where the, about 40% of the grade comes from the rubric defining the task alone. No, 70%, sorry. That is all there is. The rubric says these, 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 these what you've got to do. And that simulates, in a sense, the fact packet design that you get from your manager if you're in the field of systems analysis. We also, in what we're doing, a lot of soft skills development. We are in terms of things like presentations, we start in the first semester, first uh, year, and use presentations and develop presentations, uh, teach them how to do presentations, pretty much all the way through our program. So by the time at the end of, they've done three years of this, they're getting pretty confident at giving presentations. They know how to do it, they like doing it, um, and they are good for employability. I mean, I'm just talking to someone just now, and very nearly got a job, just because of the way he's handling some demonstrations because of our self-confidence. We're simulating business tasks all the time. What are they going to meet out there once they get into the real world? Yeah, lots of publications. I mean, I've got publications where, based on their research, I've gone to a conference and their students have got three student names as co-authors. It's undergraduate students, not master's students or PhD students. Um, most of the work I've been, research I've been doing and now going out into commercial sector 
is done by my students. I consolidate it, but there's 12, 15, 20 students doing that work. And that means that the University of Derby is now known as one of the main research areas in accuracy of geolocation services on um, smart devices. But they did it for me. What do the students say? I'd better let you read it rather than me reading it because it feels a little odd. <laughs> It means I don't get bored reading 50, 50 assignments all about the same topic, which is a danger. It also gets rid of plagiarism. Now this bit here is referring to the fact that it, about week eight, I cancel all formal seminars and workshops and have a, a schedule of the students that come through my office about every 12 minutes. They have posted their, what should be their final uh, draft on turn it in, so I've got somewhere to annotate. And then give them the feedback both in terms of presentation side, I have they met the standards of proper writing and using the template correctly, and also on the two or three topic uh, criteria. And then they have four weeks in which to incorporate that advice and then resubmit either in week 12, um, at the end of week 12 for review, in my, again in my office for the summative review, or it could be they'll do it uh, beginning of the first week of exams and then they'll come through a similar schedule and so they know their mark before they've left my office, subject to evaluation of course. And this formative review to final summative review, uh, the, f the first time students come across it tends to be worth about 20% improvement in grade. By the time they've been doing this for a couple of years, it's worth somewhere around 5%, 10%. And that's quite interesting what you can get. And it's no effort, because you're doing it effectively in your contact time for that module. And if it means if you've got too many students, you need to do it for two weeks, okay. They're still doing them a power of good. And they like it because they have learned that I do not teach answers, only questions. And I challenge them at the very beginning of the first semester when I meet them, do you expect them to teach answers or questions? And that opens up some very, very interesting discussions about what we're here at university for. Um, and if you signpost it correctly, they are remarkably um, happy. So what I want to, I think, is, yeah, what I want to see, think about over the next few minutes is these are two, about seven questions that I think we should be looking at, kind of part of, you know, profession, continuous professional development. Here's a reflective session that we can look at these sort of topics and say, how can I, in my subject, build some of these ideas into what I'm doing so I can start developing more effective, perhaps, um, ways of getting really good engagement, enthusiasm, uh, and particularly achievement. Because actually, I'm not overly interested in whether students like it or not. I'm actually rather interested in what, how they achieve. That is, to me, the most important factor in education. Is do the students end up achieving well? Because that leads to all sorts of other benefits in their future life. Whether they like it or not is kind of a little bit um, less important to me. As it turns out, I've seen those comments, actually, by the time they got used to it, they love it because they've got this autonomy. They can do their own thing. Okay, over to you folks, I'll switch this off now. <laughs>